welcome to Grew and Why are puppets being used to sell everything? Let's be frank about cars. Just like things with my ex, they're uh, complicated. Uh, wait, your ex is a human? <laughs> and she left you? Yes, she wanted no strings attached. <laughs> It's Puppet Will. <laughs> hey, Puppet Will, did you know the puppets sell Coke? Wow, this new Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. Is it the best Coke ever? No, I sell the best Coke ever. <laughs> Meet me after the show. <laughs> puppets also sell the worst Coke ever. Why not? Mm. RC stands for really creepy. <laughs> I thought you'd love RC Cola. Why is that, Puppet Will? Because your hand's up my ass, see? <laughs> Puppets are on the catwalk. Fun fact, those puppets were made from recycled clothes. You should have seen the red carpet. It used to be Elmo! <laughs> Elmo! <laughs> Facebook is using puppets to sell virtual reality. than Zuckerberg! <laughs> but wait, there's more. There's chalky milk puppets, plants puppets, KFC puppets, ice cream puppets, Ibis puppets, insurance puppets, oat milk puppets, meatball puppets, and even prostate cancer puppets. <laughs> If you're over 50, get checked out once a year. It's painless. It takes only a few seconds, and it can save your life. Hey, Will, while you're up there... <laughs> no, thanks. Don't fear the finger! <laughs> Puppets can even sell this. Win! There's mind-blowing stuff on ABC iView. <laughs> Still more human than the last iView spokesperson. Hi, I'm Charlie Pickering. <laughs> I, I was just going through your uh, search history. Wow. <laughs> Ah, he knows about Puppet Hub! <laughs> I was just checking my prostate, I swear! <laughs> OK, that's enough time to welcome our panel. Todd Sampson, Emily Taylor, Karen Ferry and filling in for Russell Howcroft. It's Russell Howcroft! <laughs> After two landlocked years, Australians are finally able to travel again and they're oozing for a cruising. P&O ads used to be filled with brags about water slides. P&O Pacific Explorer has two water slides. Easy, you're holding up the line, mate. Just get on with it. Oh, I think I used to host a show with that little girl. <laughs> but now P&O has birthed a new campaign filled with NRL stars that puts the ocean in Ocean's Eleven. Putting the crew together, bro. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, yep. I'll tell the missus. Let's do it. Boom. Who else is coming? I'd love to. Let's cruise, baby. Get your crew on board with a P&O group holiday. The Cruisy Group Getaway. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that campaign doesn't tell you what's on the ship, doesn't say where it's going, and looks more like an ad for sports bet than a luxury liner. Karen, why? I mean, I quite like it because you don't actually see the reality of what happens on a cruise because that's not what they're selling, right? They're selling the chance to live large with your mates post-lockdown. Like, even the checklist in the ad, the Ocean Style 11, of, like, marking off all your friends as opposed to any of the activities. Mm. And... It's friendcations, as it's termed, is meant to be the top travel trend of 2022. Like in the UK and the US, there's like a 26% increase on group bookings as opposed to pre-COVID. And it's just mostly with 18 to 34 year olds who are looking for a chance to make memories with their friends from all the nine outs they missed. And P&O and the other cruise liners really want you to party because that's where they make most of their money is on the alcohol sales. Not because they cost $99 a night, but because when you're drunk, 
you're more likely to go to the casino and spend all your money, which is where the real heist and the high seas begins. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to be drunk to make a stupid decision, like going on a cruise. <laughs> I think it's interesting as well that you would go after that group, because if you think about, you know, this is a category that's got some pretty bad image kind of brand associations at the moment. So, you know, there's COVID, there's food poisonings, there's collisions, there's all sorts of things sitting in our mind. And the people who normally they go after are families and retirees, for whom that's going to be a pretty big issue. So going after groups of mates who are looking for an easy holiday, it's all inclusive, it's pretty smart. And they're probably more likely to kind of weigh up those risks and go, cheap, we get a lot of holiday, let's go. Yeah. So the idea that you can, you know, all those memories that you've missed out on over the last two years, yeah. and uh, you can absolutely see that working. And you can also see, OK, oh, so groups of guys, they're going to get together, so a bunch of mates. So then a bunch of girls, they'll get together as well. They'll say, well, hang on, there's going to be a whole lot of fellas on that boat. Then, hey, girls, let's get together and we'll go and join that boat as well, right? Everyone knows what's going to happen. That's the whole purpose of those trips. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's the fun and games of the high seas. I mean, I understand why they're not showing the ship and why they're not showing the amenities and why they're not showing all the details because when it comes to travel advertising or particularly to cruising, it, you, if you break it up, they, they sell the dream on television and then the reality of the purchase yeah. happens online. So this, all this needs to do is spark people's interest. I think we're the biggest nation of cruisers per capita. So we know generally what's on a cruise ship. So like seeing, yeah, the pool, seeing the bar, seeing the casino, seeing the shops, we, mm. we know what's on mm. there. So it's like, let's talk about something that's actually new. Otherwise you're just doing what we've all seen in advertising for the past mm. 20, 30 years of cruise advertising. They're trying to sell to a new demographic. Yeah. They're shifting away from what is traditionally seen as an old, older person's holiday. And now they're trying to attract people who've never really looked at cruising as a thing. And I think this is a great way to play it as an option versus going to like a hotel on the Gold Coast where you're mm. going to get kicked out for having a party in your room. I think the other thing as well is all that imagery of the ships is what has been used in the news to cover all of these headline stories. So it's really smart to reorientate away from the asset that is the ship to the group of people who are going to be reconnecting and you're going to have fun with and you can see yourself in that environment. p and used to sell pure exotic decadence. Take me away, friendly fair star. Oh yes, yes, take me away. All of this. Nothing says relaxing like this COVID Petri dish. <laughs> have a fun time swimming in the pool while everyone stares at you. Now P&O ads are even classier. P&O's Ship Year Sale is on. Book now with just a $1 deposit and get up to $300 on board spending money per room to spend however you please. Book now and say Ship Year to a holiday like no place on earth. Ship nah. <laughs> and after you chow down at the buffet, you won't stop shipping. <laughs> the part that surprised me, you can book a piece of ship with a $1 deposit. Hmm, <laughs> still a rip-off. Emily, will that bring in shiploads of customers? Look, I think it probably mm. will. And that's because at the moment, I think it would be it wouldn't be super credible to sell the full Lux experience with the ghosts of cruises past sort of floating around our memories. I think the $1 tactic is really clever because it's a, it's a really easy first step. Mm -hmm. You know, you get your mates on board, you're not too caught up on if one of your flaky mates pulls out, you're stuck with, you know, kind of paying their deposit. But also the $1 is really clever because it focuses that whole experience, that whole holiday on being value. And in one way, what that does is it actually, it sort of lowers your expectations of the holiday, which is, which is really handy. But what it also does is it makes everything that you get just feel like great, great value and a lot for the money, which particularly in the context of, you know, kind of the airline chaos that we've got at the moment is really clever because th there you're paying 100% upfront and you don't even have a guaranteed kind of on-time takeoff or even takeoff at all. At it's, really, it's really an ad that reflects the times, doesn't it? Um, yeah. If you go back, let's go back 20 years, um, and if, you, if we could get into a time capsule, Will, and we show the CEO of P&O that ad, yeah. they would, it, that individual would completely freak out. The very notion that you're going to sell P&O brand 
off the back of a one dollar oh, deposit yeah. and mm. three hundred bucks we need to. I mean, that is that is what the textbook says you never do. Mm. Yeah, because you created this beautiful brand called P and O. The people happily get on that ship. They happily sail around the world. So you have to have really strong values attached attached to that name. Mm. The textbook would say you would never, would you ever say, get involved with P&O via a buck. Yeah. Like you, you literally would never do that. However, this is the right thing for them to do right now. And I suppose as long as they're doing that with, with their eyes wide open, it's going to be very, very, very tough for P&O in five years' time to sell themselves as they used to sell themselves. This is the issue with doing promotional marketing. Promotional marketing tends to be a downward spiral when it comes to the value that people associate to your brand. The $1 deposit is a clever persuasion mm. strategy because they're dealing with uncertainty among their customers. Mm. But they still want to lock everyone in. And they know that if you give any deposit, even if it's a tiny deposit, it dramatically increases the chances of them going through with it and you getting all your money mm. versus no deposit. So $1 is still a massive commitment emotionally. But the cool thing is, is it's financially not a big commitment for the customer. So you still lock them in and the customer feels like they have, they have space financially in case things go wrong and they, have to, and they have to cancel. And presumably for the dollar, you've got to give up a lot of data. You have to, you know, you provide them with yeah. a You probably of... have to give them your credit card details and stuff. You're not just handing over yeah. a, a dollar coin. That's right. <laughs> and you get mum's name and you get dad's name, you get granny's name, you get the kid's name, you get the dog's name, you get yeah. the cat's name, you get everyone's name. Then you've got the, you've got I those... mean, if they asked me for my dog's name and my cat's name, I'd be like, they're not coming on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> my cat has standards, won't be around rugby league by <laughs> And you've got them for life. Yeah. In the biggest news scoop since George Negus uncovered November... National November. <laughs> Damn right, George. A current affair somehow got an exclusive look on board the Virgin Cruise Liner that boasts perks like this. Oh, and if you want a tat on board the world's first floating tattoo parlour, that'll be extra. Yes, a cruise ship tattoo. So you can have two lifetime regrets at once. <laughs> but Virgin wants you to leave your other lifetime regrets at home. They've tossed the children overboard. Virgin Voyages says we can't cruise till we're 18, which makes us sh sh shake. That's why they leave the Qantas kids in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> While Viking cruises sell kid-free cruises as an intellectual experience. Be curious. Explore the world with Viking, the thinking person's cruise. With no kids and no casinos. Ah, the thinking person's cruise. You know, those sophisticated thinkers, the Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> Russell, is a kid-free cruise for parents or for the rest of us? Well, when you look at the ocean liner industry, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's like it's a physical manifestation of segmentation. So segmentation is a thing that we, you know, that marketers do all the time. So a segment being retirees, you know, over 55-year-old retirees. And then within that segment, there will be those that are wealthy, those that are not so wealthy. And then there'll be another segment which is, you know, singles looking to find a partner. And then another segment will be families who are low on income. And there is a ship for every single one of them. It's, it is the most... It's just fascinating to have a look at it. When you just think about the capital expense that goes into building one of these things, so minimum 150, 150 million to build a ship, mm -hmm. Maximum 1.4 billion to build a ship, and they're built. That, that, that's it. That's like the confidence of somebody who's looked into buying one for themselves. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I looked into it when I was thinking about yeah. this. Is this is is there a better example of what segmentation actually is, and is there a better example of of what capitalism does in order to exploit segmentation mm. to the point where it will it will find 250 million. Mm in order to build a ship, in order to get people to go on that ship, it's probably got a 35-year life. 35-year life, we're going to segment and we'll segment for the first 15 years. We'll go to upmarket families. As the ship gets older, we'll segment 
people that can't afford quite as much, and then by the time it's 35 years old, it's shagging for everyone. Mm -hmm. So that is, <laughs> it's, when I'm, it, yeah, it, it's, for me, it's a very interesting example of how our world works. Yeah, it's when, part, part of the problem is how expensive the assets are. So the, it's been commoditized. It's, they're all pretty much similar or variations of the same, but yet they need to increase the profit to be able to pay for the assets and to make money. So to do that, they create kind of unique experiences or they brand within luxury. And the Virgin one with the kids is quite an interesting example of that. I mean, the fact, uh, although I don't love the execution, I, I like the idea. Like, the idea of using kids to sell a cruise that doesn't have kids and the way they kind of tried to alleviate parental guilt by being really overt about it, like you deserve it, and blame it on Virgin, not on parents that they're going. But no kids is not just aimed at parents. No kids is aimed at adults for them to be able to have a premium price, to get more profit out of their assets, to increase it. And they can do that by saying they simply don't have kids yeah. and offer other experiences like tattoos and things. So they're working on how do you increase the profit margin of an industry that is often seen as commoditized. Not only does it appeal to parents who don't want to go with their own children, but no parents want to go with other people's children either. I mean, that's really the sales yeah. point. Like, I can handle and my if, child more than anyone else's. And I was going to say, if you're really keen to go with other people's children, you should not be allowed on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if this is for young people as much as, like, sinks and dinks, so single income, no kids, double income, no kids, are getting older, they're getting more affluent, and they want to spend their hard-earned money and their well-earned annual leave on experience that is all about tailored to them. So when you think about a cruise as a floating village, mm. if it's a family cruise, parts of those village are segmented off for children, and that's real estate. So instead of being like, oh, we need an area for kids' club, we need the playground, we need the children's movie cinema, those things can be turned into the tattoo parlour, into another nightclub. Mm. So you know that there's going to be more things for you to enjoy, but also the occupancy is suddenly all adults. So there's more people to spend time with. I just love the, that um, the Viking cruise ad, though, the idea of, like, the thinking people's cruise, and then it uses no kids and no casinos in one sentence. Like, yeah. those things rot your brain in yeah. equal measure. For an industry all at sea, cruisers don't like to talk about recent troubles, but their pre-pandemic ads should have seen it coming. Book a p and cruise for 2020 today, and Future You will receive up to $900 of on-board spending money. Future You has some bad news about 2020. <laughs> Now the closest we get to a mention in the last two years is this. Imagine a place where we can finally be free. Free to Zoom without a meeting request. Free to enjoy savoury bites and stunning sights. Sail safe. Feel free. I feel free. I'd have gone with feel like a princess, a ruby princess. <laughs> Todd, is it better to talk about it or pretend it never happened? I mean, you know... Breaking free is better than saying you're not going to get COVID. Uh, I think they have to do both. Uh, I think on television, they definitely do not want to be doing COVID because that's just general awareness across the market. You don't want to be just continuously raising the issue over and over again because the research says that 70% of people are hesitant. They'll, they may go, but they're hesitant. So you don't want to put something on television that's going to knock them into the, no, I'm going to wait. But a lot of that information is online. The majority of people that go on cruises get their information online. They get prompted on television, and then they get pushed online where they get all this information, where COVID absolutely needs to be covered in detail before people are willing to go. So they have to do both. Yeah, so we see in, in tourism the sort of journey that a customer takes is dream plan, book, and then holiday kind of share. So I totally agree. In that dream phase, which is where your TV ad is, you do not want your COVID policy in there. It's, it belongs in the website where someone who's in that plan phase can go and have a look and go tick, tick, tick. Yeah, I'm on good. Virgin Cruises has a new investor and Chief Entertainment and Lifestyle Officer, J-Lo, or as I now call her, Ice-Lo. <laughs> and they <laughs> announced the deal with this embarrassing video. Don't be fooled by the ship that I got. I am now Jenny, Jenny from the dock. Okay. Wow. T Tim Minchin's really let himself go. <laughs> this is part of a new trend. Kate Moss is the creative director of Diet Coke. I knew models loved Coke. And when Lady Gaga was appointed creative director of Polaroid, she received this response from Kanye. Because look at Gaga. She's the creative director of Polaroid. 
I like some of the Gaga songs. What the f does she know about cameras? <laughs> Big words from the creative director of Louis Vuitton. <laughs> <laughs> why are celebrities suddenly part of the company? Oh, look, there's lots of reasons why you would employ a celebrity. You know, they bring a new audience that you might not attract. They have reach in terms of they bring an ad, like something to your brand that you might be lacking. So JLo would bring a sort of feminine sexiness that Richard Branson does not exert. Um, <laughs> but also, they're more PR worthy than your traditional endorsement, right? It's like no one's going to be writing headlines about JLo appearing in a Virgin Cruise ad, but they are going to be writing headlines about her as an entertainment officer, sure. Like, it's very similar to honorary doctorates that universities and colleges give away. Um, they don't mean anything, right? The piece of paper they're on is worthless, but what they do bring is a lot of publicity and a lot of general sort of influence to attract people towards a university. Yeah. I think the big celebrities now the endorsement deals are very different than they were five years ago. Yeah. I think a lot of the endorsement deals now are equity deals, they're sales deals, and they're making multi, multi millions. And so they're investors, they're getting shares, mm -hmm. so they're kind of trying to perceptually bring them into the company. I think there's a little bit of personal brand management going on here. I think the idea that you are a collaborator rather than an endorser gives them a bit more credit as opposed to just selling out and making millions of dollars and never going on the cruise. Cruises have always loved a big musical number like this. Now I've had the time of my life. No one never felt like this before. Bang up. But we know there's only <laughs> one song that can really sell a maritime adventure, courtesy of the Australian Navy. You'll be wet, you'll be homesick and frightened, but the pride of the beat gets you. <laughs> Bet you weren't expecting that. <laughs> no, it really wasn't. <laughs> Loneliness is one of Australia's greatest unspoken health challenges. So this week, we asked our agencies to create a campaign to treat loneliness as a public health issue. Here's the first pitch. I'm Tammy. I'm Sam, and we're from Campaign Edge. While awareness doesn't change actions immediately, it's definitely the first step. So our idea is to highlight the effectiveness of other cause campaigns that Australians have rallied behind to elevate the issue of loneliness. We talk about SIDS on Red Nose Day. We talk about men's health for a month. We have special days to talk about ovarian cancer and talk genetic illnesses on Genes for Genes Day. But there's something we don't talk about at all. Loneliness. It leads to poor physical and mental health and even premature death. On January 1, it won't kill us to talk about loneliness. You've convinced me. Here's the second pitch. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm Andy. And we're from inclusive creativity agency ThinkHQ. So we know loneliness can affect anyone, and we wanted to show that connection can be found in the most unexpected places. Enjoy! Excuse me, Mr Cornwall. Are you Mark Cornwall? Yeah, what is it? Are you aware that lonely people are costing taxpayers $2.7 billion in strain put on the healthcare system? Sorry. And what do you say to allegations that there are five million people at any one time are suffering from loneliness? That's awful. I'm sorry. And what about dinner? Dinner? Yes, dinner tonight about six. Susie's doing a stroganoff. That'd be awesome, mate. Oh, great. <laughs> you don't have a cat, do you? He ran away. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Today. I'm sorry. Well, you've convinced me. Let's see what our panel think. Todd, which did you prefer? Uh, easy choice for me. I think loneliness is a serious societal concern that we have, and I appreciated the ad that took it seriously and, uh, from a tone perspective, uh, treated it with the, you know, the importance it deserves. So number two? One. No. <laughs> uh, what about you, Emily? Yeah, I, always, I also think the, the sort of gravitas that is given to it in the first one and putting it on the par with those other issues, so I'd say number one. Uh, Karen, what about you? 
I like the construct in number two of A Current Despair and trying to treat it in a really different way. But I think the simplicity of number one and the way they've set it up in terms of seeing someone go through everything, I'm going to go with number one. Uh, Russell, you've got the tiebreaker. Did you know in the UK there is a Minister for Loneliness? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so they recognise how serious this is. Which is why I do like number one. I like the fact that they actually say, this is serious, we should treat it seriously. Mm. I just wish that the line, that the, at the end it said, this is something we need to deal with every day. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Janu January 1 felt like the wrong day. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry we didn't invite you to the New Year's Eve party last night. <laughs> <laughs> but we were all talking about you and we thought maybe you were a bit lonely. So. And, I, the, and the, the second one had everyone can help. I like that. I like the idea. They're trying yeah. to give people some strategies. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Well, the good news is it doesn't matter because the other team had already won. It's yeah. number one. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Campaign Edge. We'll send you this trophy. If you don't eat all of your meals on a cruise ship buffet, you might be wondering, what's for dinner? Buying food to cook at home used to be called groceries. Now deconstructed dinners have a new name, meal kits. And they all have fun branding, like so yummy, dinner sorted, my foodie box, which I believe I watched online one night, and make out <laughs> meals, no garlic thanks, Ugh. and their ads sell convenience. Dinnerly brings home cooked meals at affordable prices. So when life does this, do dinnerly. Forget dinner, your house is haunted. Get out! <laughs> While HelloFresh serves this. HelloFresh, everything you need to make delicious and nutritious home cooked meals. Whether it's low carb, calorie smart, or veggie, get wholesome recipes and fresh ingredients that everyone will enjoy. Order your box now at HelloFresh.com.au. Tonight, I'll be eating in a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> Wes Anderson, my less talented brother. <laughs> Emily, is it best to sell convenience or lifestyle? Honestly, I just would like someone in this category to do either, because I mm. find it so frustrating. Everyone is trying to be everything to everyone, and as a result, they have created these completely interchangeable brands and products, and you can eat from one of them and then not remember the next day which one you've ordered from. And all they're doing as a result is having to throw these $50 coupons at everyone, which is a race to the bottom mm. and just completely ridiculous. So I would love to see some strategy, which is a game of sacrifice and they need to target a need and a customer and be really clear about it. One of these brands should go after meals that come in and cook can be cooked in 15 minutes and that's it, and just own it and then talk about it and build a product and an experience around it. And one of them should just really go after families, mm. like meals for fussy eaters and, you know, substitutes and all kinds of, like, great family-tested meals. And then you talk about it in your communications when you've actually designed an experience around it. You're right but it's probably early days. What you've got to do is you've got to make sure you get your brand as loud and proud as you possibly can. It, and at some point, that'll start to happen, you would hope soon. Yeah. Because you need to ensure that when you go to Google, that you type in, so the, the punter, the consumer, types in the brand that is most salient, the brand which is top of mind. We all have a ladder in our mind, Will, mm. and th that ladder in our mind has got the brand that is first in the category, second in the category, third in the category. The fight is to get to number one in that ladder in the mind. And the fight these days is to type that in when you go to Google. Because if I just type in fresh food, that's when there's a whole new fight. Yeah? And that's where all of these brands are fighting for AdWords. But wouldn't you want me, as a family, to think, oh, I saw that ad that said, hello, happy families, hello, fussy eaters, hello, fresh, hello, fresh is the brand for me, I go for that one. Yes. I think I, there's, no, there's no association with a particular need yeah. or audience. Oh, I, I, I think that the research shows that 10% of people love cooking, 45% hate it, and the rest are indifferent. Okay. And the indifference comes to inconvenience. So if you're asking what wins, convenience or lifestyle, I would say convenience. When two things are similar and marketed in a similar way, generally, we choose neither of them. Mm -hmm. we, or if we do choose, we choose on price. And that's why they're putting price in their ads, because if they're forced to choose on price, that's going to drive everyone uh, down to the bottom. So I do think they need differentiation, yeah. because you don't want it all to be about price. See, but HelloFresh has actually been in market for nine to ten years, yeah. so it's quite a while, yeah. and the ads are still just telling you what their product exactly. does. I think beyond building messaging, they also just need to actually build 
brand. Mm. Like, you don't understand what they stand for emotionally. And I think that's the thing is, like, cooking is meant to be something that's filled with heart. And these ads feel so, like, soulless. It's just, like, kind of mechanical joy. Yeah. And I think, you know, we... They also don't recognise that we are a country that's really influenced by MasterChef. Mm. So we love the idea of cooking. We want to be creative in cooking. Mm. Where are we seeing what convenience can be offered when they take away the hard stuff. It means that you have a chance to connect with your family while you're prepping a meal, which might be the most important part of your day. Like, even the racist Dolmio puppets had more fun in the kitchen than anyone in these ads. For the record, I know those puppets and they are not racist. <laughs> Pre-made meals have sold a slim down and beef up, low fat and low sugar. Now they're pumping up protein. Protein sells everything from tuna to yogurt to a pizza made from yogurt. That's some more, eh? <laughs> they also flog protein water. Yeah, do you even sip, bro? And now they're selling strength of a different kind. You want to cover tea, Dad? Mm-hmm. Yeah, load me up. The protein in my muscle, Chef, doesn't just make you strong. It makes you strong like this. This is not phone time! This is Lily Daddy time! Ah! Ah! Pop that killer on Lily! Yay! How's it coming along? My muscle, Chef. Everybody, every goal. Oh, finally, you'll have the strength to put up with your kids' shit. <laughs> <laughs> meals used to be sold to gym bros with a side of needle. Todd, <laughs> can you sell muscle meals without muscle men? Uh, I think protein is a food or diet trend that's been going on for a long time. I mean, it's... And we are very persuaded by diet advice that's simple and involves some sort of superfood. In this case, it's protein. It also is linked to us demonizing fats and carbohydrates, so protein is the only thing left that we could talk about, and we're all desperate to find something we could eat limitlessly uh, and not get fat, and protein has been positioned as that. But for me, it's deceptive. It's deceptive marketing because they have created a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. That the belief that we are deficient or heavily deficient in protein or we desperately need protein. The fact of the matter is, if you are thinking that you may not have enough protein in your diet, you probably have enough protein. It's a rich Western fad or trend that has taken off. I just think it's, I just think it's deceptive. Created a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. It's like, <laughs> that's All what we that do. <laughs> 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 oh. Russell's just sitting there going, why is Todd saying this like it's a bad thing? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> There's only one way to box up this conversation with our own Gruen Meal Kit. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, what's in here? It's just an Australiano. What is it? Yuck. <laughs> and this, the Bobcatter cap that finally arrived this week after we ordered it over 90 days ago. <laughs> and I'm not spending any more time on it. Because it's time to move on. <laughs> That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Russell Halcock, Karen Ferry, Emily Taylor and Todd Sampson. <laughs> we'll leave you with a cruising experience that puts the sea in ABC. We'll see you next week. Book your next getaway on ABC Cruises. Relax as we glide across the bluey seas. You might even see an Annabelle crab. Not only is it kid-free, there's no one under 50. You can even get your own ABC tattoo. Guaranteed to be more permanent than the ABC itself. But get in quick, this is clearly a sinking ship. ABC Cruises, because all the other channels are ship.